My name is Guy Royce. I'm a developer advocate at Redis Labs. Um, and uh, the only really important thing, because we kind of got a, a small window here for the talk, uh, so I'm, I'm going to go a little fast. Uh, the only important thing on the slide is my Twitter uh, account. Uh, I'll announce, well, other than the Redis logo, I suppose, but <laughs> is the Twitter account there, because if you want to uh, follow uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about, what I'm doing, or you want to make fun of me while I'm giving the talk, that is the place to do it. So uh, go out to Twitter, give me a follow if you uh, would be so kind. Uh, GitHub.com slash Guy Royce, there will be slides. Uh, all these slides and stuff are actually already out there. So um, you can check that out there as well. So what the heck is WebAssembly? That's probably the first question you, you would ask, right? What's WebAssembly? Uh, well, uh, in, in true SpongeBob fashion, I asked my computer wife, Karen, that'd be the SpongeBob Karen, not the internet Karen. Um, <clears throat> And she told me that it was 50% web and 50% assembly, which is uh, kind of funny, it, it, not really, but it's, it's, it's kind of a weak joke, but it's also kind of true, right? Uh, because it is assembly language for the web browser. Um, it's also kind of not true because it's moving beyond the web to uh, command line tools. And uh, it's not actually assembly, it's bytecode. Yeah, assembly is a language that renders down the machine code or bytecode. And so it's both true and false at the same time. But more than anything, WebAssembly is a solution to a problem, like any good technology, right? And that problem is JavaScript. What the hell, JavaScript? I mean, look, at, I mean, okay, so before I sit here and diss JavaScript, I want to say that I'm a fan of JavaScript. I, I run the Columbus JavaScript user group. I like JavaScript. I, I like it unironically. But it's got some really challenged corners, right? Uh, looking at some of these examples, uh, number dot, dot min value is greater than zero. Wow, I wish that was true of my bank account, right? Uh, my favorite here is parsint fire truck. Uh, this is actually a very reasonable statement. Fire truck, it turns out, is not a number, and so that's what it returns. If you say parsint fire truck comma sixteen, well, then that's fifteen, which is not a fire truck. Uh, what's going on here, of course, is that uh, when you say comma sixteen for parsint, you're you're saying uh, make this hex based. Make this a this is a hexadecimal number, so. It, you know, JavaScript dutifully goes and starts parsing the string fire truck, finds the digit F, which is 15, finds the digit I, which is not a number. And so it says, oh, I'll just stop here and 15 is good. Um, you might also be wondering uh, why I uh, chose the word fire truck here. And it's because um, my uh, my son, my oldest son, who's 19 now, but at the time he was about six or seven, he had, tells me this joke. He says, Dad, uh, I'm thinking of a word and it starts with the letter F and it ends in UCK. And he, he's kind of smiling, and he's like, fire truck. <laughs> so, so I thought that was a fun example, right? Uh, it's not totally not a passive way of me explaining my frustration with JavaScript sometimes. So the nice thing about JavaScript, though, is if you don't like it, you can pick a different language as long as it's JavaScript. Now, I, I know there's things like TypeScript, and, uh, well, and there's TypeScript. Um, uh, and you've got these these uh, tools that will transpile JavaScript, uh, non-JavaScript languages into JavaScript. But that's not really picking another language because it's still JavaScript under the covers. Um, in the previous talk, Mike uh, was kind of talking about how uh, we need to compile that JavaScript. He's right. Compiling is what we want. We don't want to transpile. I think the fact that we made up a word, uh, made up the word transpile to describe what we're doing when we're converting you know, ES6 JavaScript to, you know, vanilla, you know, to um, something that will run on Internet Explorer um, is a hint that we're doing something weird. Uh, but, you know, but we can transpile it and, and use different languages. We're not stuck with JavaScript, um, although our errors often come back to us in JavaScript. But uh, there's a, actually kind of another flaw with JavaScript, aside from its weird syntax, or not weird syntax, but its uh, weird edge cases and the lack of... Uh, linguistic diversity that you can, you can have for front-end work. And that's that it's fundamentally a scripting language. For JavaScript, we have to download the JavaScript file. And we can minify that, and that helps. But they're still kind of big. Uh, we have to tokenize that. we got to you know, we got to find all the tokens and all the syntactical tokens in there. Then we got to take those tokens and parse them into an abstract syntax tree. A syntax tree. And then once we have that, we can execute it. And we got to do that every time. Uh, now, there is caching that happens there, and V8 does uh, provide as much capability as it can, but this is an expensive process, uh, and it's just, it just affects the performance of JavaScript and browsers. And so, um, but what if uh, there was some way that we could compile code to run in the browser? If we could compile code to run in the browser, we could pick whatever language we wanted, 
and so we wouldn't be stuck with JavaScript. Uh, we could um, make it small and tight and compile it into some sort of bytecode, uh, and so we wouldn't have this parsing problem, this uh, performance issue. And that is what WebAssembly is. WebAssembly is code that has been compiled for the browser. And uh, it's kind of cool. It's, um, it's a virtual machine that runs in your browser, runs a WebAssembly bytecode. So um, I thought it might be to, to really kind of make it crystal the idea behind what WebAssembly is, is we might want to talk a little bit about the run up that gets us to WebAssembly. Uh, how did we, you know, wh what does WebAssembly work? Well, and so I'm going to, how, how does WebAssembly do what it does? How does it fit into the bigger picture? And in order to do that, I'm going to start all the way back at the beginning with microprocessors. So with um, microprocessors that we all know, you've got, um, you know, a series of bits, so ones and zeros, high voltage and low voltage, uh, that represent instructions that come in. And so an instruction might say to hey, move this value from, uh, you know, register X to register Y, uh, or put this value in a particular register. And so we've got these instructions that come in. And um, Early on, this is how you programmed computers. You just wrote machine code that represented these instructions. Um, and uh, very early on, it's flipping switches and hitting a button and hitting a button. Uh, very, very tedious. Um, and to make that problem, make programming these microprocessors less painful, uh, we came up with the idea of assembly language. So here I've got on the, on the left, we've got, uh, you know, just an arbitrary address and memory. We've got the binary representation, the bits that represent this short uh, machine language instruction, uh, machine language uh, for a 6502 microprocessor, actually. This, this was the code for my first uh, machine, uh, uh, machine language work, the first code I ever wrote in machine language uh, back in the 80s. Uh, we've got uh, that, those same numbers translated hex. You can see hex is a little easier to work with, but you still got A000, what does that mean? But in assembly, you can write a little text document and use mnemonics, things that make it easy for humans to understand. So you can see like LDY for load Y, and then zero, zero for uh, the value zero. So load zero into the Y register. And, uh, and then the assembler would go through this code and turn it into byte for byte. You know, this symbol means this hex code, and this symbol means this hex code. And so there's a one-to-one -one correlation from the assembly to the machine code. And uh, that was a, a great innovation. It made programming much easier, uh, but it did mean that you had to learn a different assembly language for every species of microprocessor. And it was also kind of hard to work with. And so we introduced higher level languages like C. Uh, this is you know, uh, some sample C code here. It does the same thing it, uh, that that assembly code does, but it's in C. And with C, we can take that code and compile it as opposed to assembling it. And we'll get a binary that's similar to uh, the binary that we you know, coded in assembly. And then we can run that on our 6502 microprocessor and life is grand. But there's a problem with this. I write it in C and I compile it for this processor, but there's a lot of processors. Uh, and so I need to compile it for all the processors. And sometimes I can't take advantage of all the processors capabilities because I want to preserve backwards compatibility. I want to make sure my code will run on the most number of machines because I'm selling my software, right? And so uh, we solved this problem the way that we solve all the problems uh, in computer science, which is we added a layer of abstraction. We added a um, we added a virtual microprocessor. And so instead of having a physical microprocessor, we got a virtual microprocessor that has a, a bytecode. It has an assembly language of its own. And we can compile to that bytecode, and then it will in turn interpret the code uh, into something that the microprocessor can see. So here we've got, uh, it's no longer C code, it's Java code. And you can tell it's Java code because it's identical. Uh, actually, you can tell it's Java code because it's got that cafe babe at the very beginning of it. And then that Java code runs on the virtual machine and then the virtual machine uh, hands off instructions to the microprocessor in an interpreted fashion. And these can get smarter and more sophisticated for performance. And you can actually get faster performance out of these virtual machines than you can the uh, the uh, the, the physical ones, because you can optimize, you can do just in time compilation and optimize it for exactly the specific hardware you have. So you, you can crank a lot of power out of these things. It's actually pretty cool. WebAssembly is exactly the same idea for the browser. So now we can take the C code or, or whatever language you want, compile it to bytecode, to WebAssembly bytecode, and then create a file that um, all the major browsers can uh, read and work with. So that's what WebAssembly is. It's this idea of a virtual microprocessor in the browser. Pretty cool. I think it's cool. Um, 
So let's get into the nuts and bolts of WebAssembly and see how we can actually do this. And uh, I'm going a little fast because I want to have time for my demo because um, I, I kind of want to show off that this stuff is real and you can actually use it today. Uh, a WebAssembly module is literally just a file. It's a .wasm file specifically. And uh, I, I kind of think of them as like DLLs. Uh, if you've got a, 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 a Windows background at all, if you did any early Windows developments, because they're basically a, a, a bag of functions. And so here we've got, you know, say a simple calculator uh, module that has five functions for doing basic mathematics, for doing basic, basic arithmetic. And so that's all a WebAssembly module is, is, is bytecode in, in a file with a WASM extension. It's just a binary file, but that exposes these, these functions. In the browser, you have, uh, it becomes just another file that you download. So on the left here, we have our site CSS, our index.html, and our app.js. And um, these are sort of the, you know, the classic trifecta of uh, web, uh, front end web development, you know, and get your, your you know, wonderful site.css, it says effort display none. Um, got a really basic HTML. Uh, we got some, uh, uh, an app.js. And then WebAssembly is just another file that the web browser can download. And uh, we've got some little code here that shows you how that works, but I, I got better slides for that. Uh, the, the interesting part here is the arrows. So uh, your app.js, of course, can interact with your DOM and manipulate it, right? That's that's the essence of web apps. Uh, but you can also, uh, it can also uh, interact with WebAssembly and WebAssembly can interact with it. So my JavaScript code on the front end becomes something that WebAssembly can talk to and I it can talk to WebAssembly. Now you'll notice there's not an arrow connecting WebAssembly to the DOM right up here. Right, right up here. I'm, I'm, I'm arrowing. I'm pointing on the wrong screen, uh, and um, that's true. Uh, WebAssembly cannot talk to the DOM yet. It's being worked on. It's a hard problem, but uh, it can talk to JavaScript, which can talk to the DOM. So you can write glue code to solve that problem. But uh, this is just sort of the ecosystem these modules live in. Um, to use it uh, from JavaScript, uh, we've got uh, a really simple bit of code here that includes a callback and everything. Um, the, the key thing here is to create a WebAssembly module you call fetch and then just the path to the file. And then you, you feed that fetch call into instantiate streaming. And that will asynchronously retrieve uh, your module. Once you have the module, you can just call methods on it. Um, the module has an instance, the instance has exports, the exports are where all your functions are at. And you just call them and use them like you would any JavaScript function. It's actually really easy to use it once you have one. If you want to import some functions that WebAssembly, WebAssembly can call back against, uh, then you can create this little uh, higher, this little object structure up here that has all your callback functions in it and pass that in uh, all when you instantiate the WebAssembly module. And so that provides functions that WebAssembly can then use to call back. The idea here is, is that perhaps when we call uh, add, subtract, and multiply, it also calls a callback reporting the value in addition to returning it. So that's the idea here. And so that would allow us to like log out all our answers in addition to having code to it. It, it creates sort of an event model in a way. Um, from the WebAssembly side of things, I'm going to show you WebAssembly text format, which is the assembly language for WebAssembly. And uh, WebAssembly text formats um, looks like this. Um, it has a, a module. Uh, the module declares everything starts with a module. It's the container for everything. Uh, if you want to declare some functions, you just uh, declare them using the syntax here, uh, func dollar add. You give it a couple of parameters if you need them. You give it a return value if you need it. Uh, these are both 32-bit integers, and it returns a 32-bit integer. And then you've got your implementation of that function. And same thing for subtract and, and other functions. Uh, to export those functions, you just have to add an export statement and give it a string right here. That then. Uh, you know, it's an externally facing alias to the internal function. So you, you can, in effect, have private functions in WebAssembly by ne not exporting them. Uh, to import, to, to access that math callback that I showed you on the JavaScript side, you just use this import syntax here, and you just use those, those two keywords that were there in that, that object hierarchy, and you just give it a, a name internally. So this is just mapping it internally. Um, WebAssembly is stack-based. So it's a stack-based virtual machine. So what that means is that when you call a function, uh, you, there are no intermediate variables. Uh, you just use the stack instead. So uh, local.get $a means get the first parameter that was passed into this function and put it on the stack. 
dollar B means get the second one. So now we have two items on our stack, five and 10. When we call add, add will pop those two values off the stack because add wants two values. If they're not there, then it'll error. And then uh, it will add them together and push the answer back onto the stack. Then when we're at the end of the function, um, well, then there's one item on the stack, that's the return value. So that's, that's how these work. This is how a stack-based uh, assembly language works. Uh, here's a slightly fancier example uh, that shows the, the callbacks in action. And this is interesting because you gotta mind, you got to be mindful of how the stack works here. So after we, uh, you know, I define a local variable up here. You can actually define locals. Uh, and then after we add them, I set that local. And then uh, in order to return, uh, in order to call the callback, I got to put something on the stack for it, its arguments. So I, I get the, the local that I created. And then in order to have a return value, I got to get that again. So I, I end up having to get that local value a couple of times uh, in order to return it and do the callback. So the stack's a little clunky and weird sometimes. However, uh, you can use S expressions uh, to clean up your code and it makes your WebAssembly text format look a little more lispy, shall we say. And so that's uh, it's kind of fun too. It makes it, makes it actually a little more uh, pleasant to program in. Uh, there are a lot of other stuff in the syntax here. You've got shared memory, which uh, means it's a shared block of memory that JavaScript and WebAssembly can both see. Uh, you've got globals, which are like shared memory, but they're just an individual value that JavaScript and WebAssembly can again both see. And you've got tables, which are, um, again, JavaScript and WebAssembly can both see those, but tables are a way of doing uh, like lists of functions so that you can uh, dynamically bind functions in languages, like for polymorphism and C++ and stuff like that. So this is some other more advanced stuff that I'm not gonna go into. Um, if you want to program WebAssembly in something other than WebAssembly text format, which you might want to do, um, these are the two go-to languages that are, have the deepest support at C and C++ and Rust. And I think of the two, Rust actually has the better support. Uh, Rust out of the box, just install Rust and you have WebAssembly support, it just works. Uh, I mean, you, you have to do stuff, but there's nothing extra that you have to install other than uh, a particular target. And uh, there's a lot of others. Go out to this link here at Awesome Wasm Languages. I, I was looking at it the other day, and uh, COBOL was even on the list of, of all things. So um, there's a lot of a lot of stuff happening in the WebAssembly space. Uh, coming down the pike, you know, I've just been showing stuff with numbers, and uh, there's a reason for that, and that's because uh, WebAssembly doesn't know what a string is. And that's because how what what is a string, right? What does C mean when it says a string? What does Rust mean when it says a string? Is that UTF-8 encoded? Is that, you know, what, what's the encoding on that? And so uh, one of the things that are coming down the pike is interface types that will allow you to create some common types that WebAssembly modules can export and that uh, like the browser would understand how to make use of. They're uh, super bleeding edge. Um, there's some polyfills that make them work. I was playing with them and then Newer code says we've turned that off for the time being until the standard stabilizes. So it's super bleeding edge, but this will solve this problem. Uh, threads are, I, I believe threads work in Firefox now. I haven't looked at them yet. Uh, but the thing I think is particularly interesting is WASI, or WASI. This is the WebAssembly systems interface. And uh, that allows you to do a file IO and network IO outside of the browser. So if you're doing something with a command line tool, like with a WASM time, then you could use WASI. And I'm actually gonna, gonna demo that along with some other things here really quick. So, <clears throat> excuse me, let me let me grab a drink here really quick. Okay, it's water, but it had root beer in it. Now it tastes kind of root beer-like. So well, let's get on with the demo here. So, no, I didn't want to do that, but that's okay. So I've got, um, I've, I've created FizzBuzz in WebAssembly. And I've created it three different ways. I've created it in um, Java in, uh, for the browser, uh, once in uh, WebAssembly text format, once in Rust, and once I created a FizzBuzz that runs on the command line. Uh, the two that run on the browser, I'm using Jasmine because it's a convenient, embeddable uh, sort of um, testing framework. I just had to drop some files in there. You didn't have to install anything. Uh, and it runs and hits, uh, looks for the FizzBuzz.wasm and the Rust uh, fizzbuzz.wasm and test them both. And, it, and I have this up and running now. So if we bring this up and I hit refresh, you can see that it does indeed run all the tests pass. 
Now I want to prove that this is real, not vaporware. So um, I am going to actually compile something here. So he, here we have uh, fizzbuzz.wat. And so this is the code that does fizzbuzz. It returns minus one for fizz, minus two for buzz, and minus three for fizzbuzz. And so um, I'm not going to go over the code too much here, but I'm, I'm going to go ahead and change the constants. So for fizzbuzz, I'm going to return 30, 20, and 10 instead, negative versions of those. And then I'm going to compile it using WebAssembly Binary Toolkit. WebAssembly Binary Toolkit, or Wabbit, uh, has a tool called wat to wasm So Wabbit has wat to wasm which is kind of funny. Um, and then I pass it my wat file, so wat to wasm fizzbuzz.wat, and that will spit out a new wasm file for me. Um, and if we do a little ls here, you'll see that uh, the, the timestamps change to 2.05, uh, which is my local time. And if we do a hex dump on the fizzbuzz.wasm, you'll see that that is the entire file. It is 111 bytes. That is compact AF, isn't it? Um, so uh, I've changed this. It, it does different things. Let's see it fail. Whoops, wrong key combination. There we go. Now we now uh, all of them failed. Uh, well, not all of them, but all uh, almost all of them failed. And the Rust one I didn't touch, so it didn't fail. And um, I can actually go out and pull these from the uh, from the console here. So let's say uh, let m for module equal await. And I got a little helper function I wrote called load wasm. Um, and I say load wat slash fizzbuzz dot wasm. And then I've got a function m dot fizzbuzz. It even auto detects it. And let's pass it like 15. It returns minus 30. Let's pass it 10. See, so that broken version is there. I can also uh, go out and get the Rust version, which I'm not. I'm actually, I'm not going to show the Rust version. Type in the Rust version because the path's long and complicated. But you can see that it's actually doing things. Now, the Rust version here is a lot simpler. Um, because it's, it's Rust and it's a higher level language. And so I'm just doing a modulus and doing some matching and returning it here. But if I want to build it, I can uh, just do, um, I can do, uh, I've got a cargo toml set up for this. So I can do cargo build slash slash target. And then I got to say wasm32 unknown unknown. And then I want to do a release build because that will make it about 200 bytes. If I do a debug build, I'll get like one and a half megabytes because like everything from Rust will be in there. Uh, so that creates the new file. If I do an ls uh, target uh, wasm32 release, we can see that we have the fizzbuzz.wasm that is 258 bytes. If I do a hex dump, you can see that that is, um, yeah, I got to get an actual file name, don't I? We can see that it's it's very very short, and uh, that that of course will run as well. Uh, the really cool thing that is um, that I think is the uh, fizzbuzz io .wat. and I, here I have written a fully string running everything uh, using uh, uh, the sort of temporary version of WebAssembly interface types. Um, so here we're importing something from uh, wasm time uh, from wasi unstable and a, a write, so we can write out to standard io. And this is actually a lot of code that uh, defines strings and does the fizzbuzz calculation and writes new lines. And then in order to take numbers and turn them into strings, we had to, or take strings and turn them, numbers, turn them into strings, we had to do loops and all kinds of crazy stuff. And all this code is out in GitHub for you to explore. But the cool thing is, is that I can do wat to wasm, uh, fizzbuzz.io.wat, and it just compiles it, it just works. And so here we see that all of that code is 609 bytes. And when we do wasm time, which is the command line tool, uh, this code loops from 1 to 50 and computes fizzbuzz for everything. And if it's not a number, then it just skips it. And so this is a, a little command line version of fizzbuzz. So kind of cool. It, it's real stuff. You can do real things with it. Uh, I think WASM time is kind of like Node.js to WebAssembly. That's sort of, I think, a, a proper analogy for it. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much what I got. Here's a, a good little list of resources here to check out. 
<clears throat> WebAssembly org, uh, github.com slash WebAssemblies. Uh, that's the official stuff. Uh, Mozilla Developer Network has great documentation on using the WebAssembly JavaScript side stuff in the browser. Uh, the WebAssembly binary toolkit, Wabbit, is, is here. Wasm Times, the command line tool you just saw me use, um, it's great. Uh, there's another thing similar to it called Wasmer, um, which even has a, a package manager called Wapm. Um, uh, Wazzy, uh, the Wazzy specs are at wazzy.dev. Uh, if you want to build something big, uh, Rust is probably the best language to, to choose at the moment. And of course, there's a link to awesome Wasm languages. Uh, here's uh, a link to the code and slides. So you can hit that QR code, uh, and that will take you out to my GitHub, and you can go get all that stuff. And um, worth noting, uh, I work for Redis Labs, so please go check out our stuff. We've got a Discord server and some community forums. And if you want to sign up for a free class at Redis University, uh, we'd love to have you. And that's pretty much all I got. Uh, thanks a lot for listening to my talk. Uh, give me a follow. And uh, are there any questions? Do we have time for questions? Thank you so much, Guy. That was very interesting stuff. Um, and we've had some comments saying that uh, you've convinced them to uh, find some time to invest in WebAssembly. So I, I can see that now. I, I can actually see the, uh, the, all the comments again. So, <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in here or in, uh, in Slack. Um, I will also monitor Slack. And uh, I've, tw I've posted your Twitter uh, just earlier so people can yeah. follow, you, follow you there. Um, and if you can just put in the link for your uh, slides, because I, I I didn't have the chance to uh, well, write it down. Yeah, the the, the link uh, I'll, I'll put it on Twitter. Um, and I'll, I'll throw it in here too. I don't have it super handy, but um, uh, no worries. I'll throw it in here. Uh, the there's there's a question that just came in. What are the best Wasm games? Uh, the uh, well, there's one. Uh, I don't know if this is the best one, but it's kind of fun. Uh, a, a gentleman whose name I I don't remember implemented. Uh, the game of life, Conway's game of life, in WebAssembly text format. So in in this kind of uh, uh, syntax here, uh, to run in a browser. And so that was kind of impressive. I don't know if it was a fun game, <laughs> <laughs> but I was impressed that uh, he had written it. Uh, so, uh, but it is actually, I think it has some enormous potential for browser-based games, uh, because you just got to write some glue click code from your WebAssembly to uh, Canvas, and then it can do all the heavy lifting. And, and it performs a lot better. Uh, I've seen for benchmarks as low as 30% faster and as high as 20 times faster. So it's probably about twice as fast, maybe, you know, splitting the difference. <laughs> yeah, so you, you could definitely see a performance game, I'm pretty sure, uh, by using it just WebAssembly there. faster. Yeah. <laughs> There's also, yeah. Um, and that's, that's also been the, the main topic during the whole day. Like, it's all about a JavaScript footprint. Uh, and how it takes up a lot of uh, a lot of bandwidth, and how can we reduce it, and how can we find ways to reduce the bandwidth of our JavaScript applications? So, uh, yeah. so that was very interesting. I, I think it'd be interesting to see if um, you know Mike. Mike's previous talk was talking about compiling to uh, Vanilla JS, and it's like, well, you could take that one step further. That would be really yeah, exactly. cool. <laughs> <laughs> Spelt to Wasm, right? And that also, I I love all the acronyms in in. Oh, they're Wasabi. fun to say. <laughs> Wasm, Wazzy, Wabbit. Wattawasm is part of Wabbit. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Very Thank you so much.